welcome back to the channel everybody dr john here and uh this is an impromptu video i was receiving some emails from some professors that i support and uh the topic of um engagement in the classroom came up and i have a professor who is doing wonderful things with nearpod if you're not familiar with nearpod it's a platform that allows you to create some engagement activities for your learners while you're lecturing they can do polls they can answer questions it's really great uh, but if you're not paying for a nearpod there are limits as to how many lessons that you can have in that program and so it made me think uh, people need to know about some different ways that they can uh, engage their learners in their classroom there's so many tools out there so many any educational technology tools that you can use in your instruction um, to uh, facilitate engagement, to get feedback. And so I'm just going to power through some. This is not going to be an in-depth tutorial on any of these because Google exists. And if you need more help, you can put it in the comments. But this is these are just some of the things that have popped into my brain about ways that you can enhance your learning, to assess learners, to engage learners in an online or face-to-face -face format. So before we get started, make sure to like and subscribe. My name is Dr. John Pauls. I'm an instructional designer and a learning consultant. I've been doing it for years, and I'm really passionate about engagement in the classroom using different methods and modalities to reach learners. And so I have a huge toolbox full of different tools and techniques. So I'm going to share some of those with you now. So again, make sure to like and subscribe. Let's talk about some different tools that you can add to your programming. So the very first one, if you're not familiar with Microsoft Flip, this is a video response platform. This was initially created by a university professor as a way to communicate with his PhD students so that they can show him what's going on in their studies. It has transformed a lot since then. It's used heavily in K through 12, also in higher education. But Microsoft Flip is free for anybody if you want to go and log in, create an account. But essentially, it is think of a discussion board. Uh, this is a video response platform. So if we were to go, I can create a group. A group is like a classroom. Um, and then in that group, we can have different topics. So I might do something like have an introduction to the cohort where people will tell me their name, um, what they do, what their experiences are with our different assignments. Um, this can be for a reflection after class. If if you've been teaching about marine biology, maybe you'll have a reflection at the end in a video format where people discuss either some misconceptions or things that they did not understand, or they can share what they did understand. Um, there's a lot of possibilities with being able to use something like Flip. It is literally, it's, it's a video discussion platform. You're the one that decides what students are going to respond to. So again, it is free, really easy. The video recording studio is embedded within Flip. So essentially, if we were to just go and I can record, it's probably not going to work now because I'm doing too many screen sharings, but you enter in the studio, you press play, press record, and you're ready to go. So um, this is uh, Microsoft Flip. Excuse my background at the house. Um, but it's really, really, uh, it's a nice way to get student responses using videos. If you want to know more about Flip, uh, Google Microsoft Flip, and you'll find more information out there. The next one is Nearpod. If you've not used Nearpod, this is a way to build presentation slides or to build interactive activities. So I can create a lesson, a video that has built in questions or an activity. And in our activities, we can do something like a matching pair. We can have students draw items or there's an interactive game called Time to Climb. So I'm going to actually go ahead and show you this one right here. We can do a student paced version where they can do it on their own. Or if you're in class together, we can do a live presentation. And um, what it's going to look like is something like this. You will put in your questions that students are going to answer. This one I really enjoy because it gets students learning about and it kind of gets them motivated to try different things because they're competing against each other. It presents the questions and then students on their own devices are rated in accuracy and time of response. And so um, if I answer all the students answer right there, it'll be on the screen for them. Uh, multiple questions are available. Again, it is a really nice way to get information from your students. You provide them with a code on your screen and they will be able to join that activity. Let's go ahead and I'm going to go do, let me just do a student paste. You see right here, they can join and we're going to go ahead and let's see. Go in here, they'll just get that little join link students would sign in 
and then we would be able to see them in the activity. So we've got our time to climb. They're going to character. And again, it's just a really nice, <laughs> it's a nice way to um, add some different engagement pieces into your lessons. The Nearpod library has tons of different um, pre-made activities that you can use. We can also do a quick launch of an open-ended question, a collaborative board where people can work in the same space. So Nearpod is a really great way for you to add some engagement pieces that students can interact with just using their cell phones or their computers. CuriePod is the next one. It is very much like Nearpod, but it is powered by artificial intelligence. So here I can create with uh, AI or I can create my own. We can do a full lesson. We can add some interactive elements to existing slides. We can do a brain break. So we can go ahead in here. Let's do professional development and do magic. And again, CuriePod, very, very similar to Nearpod, except it has the power of artificial intelligence, meaning that you can really do whatever you want to in here. So um, again, another tool for you to explore using CuriePod. Um, I haven't used as much uh, just because I haven't had the opportunity to do so. But again, it gives you results. It gives you content um, and a few word. What is the purpose of a PowerPoint? And uh, you know it'll tell you tell you the content. So CuriePod, if you want to explore that, very similar again to Nearpod, except it's powered by artificial intelligence. The next thing that I use regularly in my practices is something as simple as a Microsoft form or a Google form. If you use Google instead, I'm a Microsoft guy. And so this, what I do, because your forms can be shared with a link or with a QR code, I embed these forms into my presentations. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. But here, all we have to do is we can create a new quiz, or if you're not going to grade it, we can just have a new form, which is like a survey. And you can put in any sort of questions, multiple choice, a rating, a date question, Likert scale, upload files. And so what I use it for is at the end of every presentation in my weekly course, I give them an exit ticket. And so here I reiterate what is due by what date so that there's no confusion. Um, I give them a space to give me information uh, or ask questions in a more safe manner because nobody's seeing these except for mine. And I also use this for attendance. And so once I have my actual survey that I want them to use, all I do is I go and I collect my responses and I can grab the link or I can grab the QR code and I just put that on my presentation for students to scan on when I'm presenting and I get their information in their data. And I can actually go in and I can view the responses, um, view results, see what people are saying. Uh, it's, it's a nice, easy, easy thing to do. So if you want to collect data from your students, Microsoft Forms or Google Forms is fantastic. Along that same line, if you want a more collaborative um, environment for your students to ideate and to come together and think about things uh, think about a digital whiteboard microsoft again has a whiteboard capability i can create a whiteboard based on a te template so if we need to do um just a topic of brainstorm we can use a template place it there I can adjust any of these instructions i can have students if we're discussing five different topics i can adjust the topic, what each topic is going to be. And then all I need to do is share it with my students via a link. So um, people in my organization with the link can edit. I can copy this link and provide it to my students. And they can all come in on the whiteboard and work and collaborate together. So here we, I can have students come in and they can do some editing. They can help me with the different topics. They can put their information and their thoughts in this digital whiteboard. Again, it's a choice. It's an opportunity for students to get active using technology in their classes. But using a digital whiteboard is another way that you can engage your learners. The next one that we have is Minecraft. And you may think, oh, this is too hard, John. It really isn't. It's it's uh, in Minecraft, if you've never used it, it is a digital world. People can learn about coding through Minecraft, but you don't have to. Um, essentially, in Minecraft, it's like a video game. And you use your keyboard on your device to move. So uh, with the W key, the A key, the D key, and I think it's the S key is up 
down, right, and left. Um, but there's a quick start guide. There are so many ways for you to learn how to do this. But there's a whole education edition when it comes to Minecraft. So here you can see subject kits. So if you teach science, math, computer science, art and design, history and culture, language arts, digital citizenship, social emotional, equity inclusion, and climate and sustainability, you have pre-made worlds and lessons that you can use with your learners. So since I am teaching computer science, let's go ahead and go into computer science over 200 hours of computer science content for all levels so we can go and we can find there's one on our code generation ai and escape estate um, inclusion so if i found one that i liked i could click on it to learn more as the teacher and in here you'll see that it tells me the learning objectives of this course, it tells me that what students will be able to do. It gives me teacher preparation guides, and which also includes like an introductory video and an educator guide that tells me more about this activity, guiding ideas, student activities. And then if I determine that this is what I want to do, all I need to do is copy the link and provide it to my learners and they'll be able to open up this world in Minecraft and play along. So this is something I highly suggest. Again, you don't have to be an expert in Minecraft to actually use it. I am not an expert in Minecraft, but I can tell my students how to move around and how to interact and how to do what is necessary to meet the needs of each specific lesson. So. So Minecraft education, again, a really nice way for you to supplement some learning with some interactive gamified elements, some coding practice. Um, it's not too difficult. And I highly encourage you, again, it's free. So practice and explore on your own. And if it's something that you feel like will be appropriate for your learners, jump out and try it. It's not too hard. It just seems a lot scarier than it is. The next resource that I have is i don't know if this is how you say it but i call it pfet <laughs> it's probably not it's probably fet i don't know but this is an interactive simulation provider from the university of colorado at boulder and so these are expert crafted simulations that you probably wouldn't be able to get otherwhere uh, elsewhere so if you're teaching physics chemistry math earth science or biology um there are 167 interactive simulations and lessons that you can explore so if i'm using math I can come in here and we can look at some of the different activities. So we've got center and variability, Kepler's laws, calculus grapher, number play, mean, um, ratio and proportion, number line operations. And when you click on any of these, um, I'm not going, let's go back to, um, let's do earth science as well. Let's unclick that one. So earth science, the greenhouse effect, density, diffusion, gases, um, under pressure and if you click on any of these or your students click and play with these if we click play you'll see it opens up um and here we go and i, I really don't know how to do this i'm not it's been a while since i was in there but you can see See here, we can actually pick different um, fluids to measure the, um, is that the, the pH scale of those fluids? So vomit, that's fun. Oh, there we go. And the more vomit we have, <laughs> what's the pH? And so again, these are ways for you to, and if we diffuse some of it with water, you know, I don't really know. Oh, there, there we, what, are, what is it doing? Oh, there you go. So, and if we add more water, it's going to tell us the pH is increasing, right? Is that right? And if I switch to blood, the pH is at a 7.4. And if I water it down, the pH is actually decreasing with that. So interesting things. That is, um, again, phet.colorado.edu. There are tons of different interactive simulations that you can provide to your students free of charge. So uh, definitely check that out. The next thing I'm going to share is Genially. This is a way to create interactive games for your learners. And the great thing is if you subscribe to Genially, you can actually export these in a way that will go directly into your learning management system with the SCORM file um, so that you could track learner progress. So here is a sample. Actually, let's go ahead and do this one since it is the holiday season. I made this uh, for a professional learning opportunity. It was a monthly trainer call. 
that I did with an organization that I work with. And so here, this is a way, again, to create some interactive games that can be shared with learners. So I can click start. Sorry about that. So essentially, they go through each of these water globes and they, um, let's go answer the questions based on what you put in there. And then let's see. I think these are right. It's been a while since I've done this one. Oh, I got some wrong. <laughs> There we go. Okay, yeah. Okay, so then we're going to continue and we go to the next one and so on and so forth. So you can add your own pictures, your own images to create some interactive activities. Um, I like this one because at the end when students were done and they completed it all, they could decorate a little Christmas tree or a holiday tree. Um, but there are, again, so many different pre-made templates in Genially that you can use. If we take a look real quickly, we can go to, let's go home. Are we in the home? Let's see, from a template. They've got presentations, infographics, gamification, interactive images, videos, guide, training materials. So they've got quizzes, magnetic board quizzes, prehistory quiz. So tons of templates. You don't have to start from scratch. You can go in there and add your own questions if you like the theming and the layout. And then you can share with a link. Uh, and so Genially, again, is a nice way to add some interactive elements to your coursework. And then finally, this one is my go-to for everything that I do, which is Canva. If you've not yet explored Canva, it is free for K-12 through educators. Um, it does cost for university educators, but it is well worth it. I pay for it every month, and I'm glad that I do. I have videos on my channel uh, more in-depth about Canva, how I use it for my presentations, for my videos, for worksheets, for um, really anything that I need, for letters, for documents. It is a visual design suite. And so you can see here, we can create docs, whiteboards, presentations, worksheets, resumes, social media posts and graphics, videos, uh, tangible items like business cards, uh, phone wallpapers, so many different ways to explore. And the way that I use it, I'll be happy to show you some of these. I do all of my presentations in Canva. And so if I'm lecturing around the country, if I'm lecturing in the classroom, I use Canva for those lectures. And so um, they've got so many assets that you can use. There is AI compatibility in these. And so it just provides you with a lot of different options for how you're going to engage the learners. So for instance, if I go back to, let me go back to my projects. For the classes that I teach, so this was this semester's, I copy the slide deck over week to week and then I adjust the content for my learners. Uh, depending on what we're doing. So if I picked up the artificial intelligence week, you can see I'm in the design space. I can add images, graphics. I put all my information, screenshots of what to do, and then I can provide a QR code for the exit ticket for that week. So as I'm cycling through my presentation, here we go. As I'm cycling through, um, it is a nice way to kind of keep the information ready for my students. And because I don't have to download any of these, I can present right from the web browser. I don't ever lose my files. It's a magical thing to be able to use um, Canva for that process. So that was it. That was one, two, three, four, five, maybe five different items that you can use right now to enhance your engagement in the classroom. There are so many other ones that you can use. I know this is already getting to be a lengthy video. So if you are curious about any of the things that we discussed, or if you need more tailored help or support, make sure to drop a like and a comment below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, make sure to check out the other videos on my page because it may give you more inspiration and ideas on how you can assess, engage with, and interact with learners in the classroom room in 2023. There are lots of different options. So it's up to you to decide what works best for your practices and for your learners. So until next time, this is Dr. John signing off. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.